Good evening. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, um, and happy Father's Day, by the way, to all of our dads. Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms, since I know we're like a month late, two months. But we didn't get a chance to say it before, so uh, we're going to lump them all in to one here this weekend. Uh, you probably noticed there's some candy on the tables on your way in. That's for you dads to pick one and take home. Um, there's some flowers out on the bench uh, under the... Uh, awning out there. Uh, that's for the moms. Take home a four pack of flowers with you uh, because we want to celebrate God's gift of you to us. Um, also, uh, you probably noticed the roof is complete. I'm pretty sure we are 100% done, so thanks be to God for that. Um, we have, uh, I feel like there's a couple of other announcements I'm missing, but I don't know what they are. Uh, we're actually, yes, we're having elders meeting tomorrow uh, to meet and see what we're going to do going forward and uh, update our going plan. So stay tuned for that. The following Monday, may as well give you a heads up early, we're having our uh, council meeting um, to prepare for our voters meeting in July. As we gather, let's remember, of course, that all of our gifts we thank and praise God for and are meant to serve him. And so we open with our first hymn.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue by speaking the introit responsively. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling. When I am afraid, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, Because your abiding presence always goes with us, keep us aware of your daily mercies, that we may live secure and content in your eternal love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. Our Old Testament lesson today comes from the book of Jeremiah, the 20th chapter. O Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whispering, terror is on every side. Denounce him, let us denounce him. Say all my close friends, watching for my fall. Perhaps he will be deceived. Then we can overcome him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor will never be forgotten. O Lord of hosts, who tests the righteous, who sees the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them, for to you have I committed my cause. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of the evildoers. And this is the word of the Lord. The epistle comes from Romans, the sixth chapter. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, to make you obey their passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you are slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and to its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. We stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 10th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A, dis a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? 
So, have no fear of them. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. And this is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We have been brought to acknowledge our Lord, and so we do so now in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, he's from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace, peace, and mercy from our Father in heaven be and abide with each of you through our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'll reiterate it again, partly because I'm a dad and so I like it. Happy Father's Day to all you dads out there. And again, happy Mother's Day, belated though it is. After all, um, I think we can all agree that it's worth celebrating those two roles because it is one of the hardest jobs you will ever have to have if you ever become one. And as you well know, it's one of the most important jobs there is. At least, God certainly thinks it's pretty important. They were his idea, after all, parents. Family. Men and women who come together as husband and wife and therefore become um, hus mothers and fathers. It's all his idea. Not that everyone, of course, is called to those roles, and not everyone needs to be, and it doesn't make anyone less important if they aren't called to be husband or wife or mother or father. But all the same, God has made parents and he has made families pretty important to the way the whole world works. Being a mom and dad, respecting our moms and our dads. God, in fact, values all of that so much that he even made sure it was one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother. And it's not just there. All throughout Scripture, it's obvious that there is very little that is as important to God, that God takes so seriously as the relationship between parents and children. He blesses it over and over again. He often avenges it when it suffers some kind of damage from outside. He punishes when it gets broken from the inside. In Mark 7, Jesus himself goes on to say that honoring your parents is even more important than cooking up new ways to show some kind of honor to God. He criticizes people who would rather donate to the temple than support their parents. In Jesus' mind, one of the main ways if, to honor God is to actually do what God calls you to do. And one of those things is respect your father and your mother. Paul even says in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that anyone who won't care for his family, that person has forsaken the faith. He is worse than an unbeliever. I could go on and on with examples from Genesis all the way up to Revelation, but it's pretty plain. In God's mind, there is almost nothing that trumps family. Which is a very good reminder in our culture where family, frankly, is often understood as kind of a choice about who you value the most rather than the gift that God gives you of actual blood relations. There are so many people um, who talk as though it's the people who happen to care about you, who you can count on, that are really your family, at least more so than the family that God has forged you into through the bonds of blood. If I had a nickel for every time I've heard somebody say something like, it's the people who you can count on when you need them that are your real family, as a way of excusing themselves from caring about their actual family. I can tell you, I would be driving a much nicer car than a Hyundai. But for all those ideas of our culture, parents are God's gift. Family is God's gift. It's a bond he forges when he gives a child to a parent. And no doubt it's true that all families are shot through with sin. It's no doubt true that a lot of families are twisted in some truly awful and downright tragic ways. But that fact is very rarely a reason to abandon those bonds that God makes or the gifts that God gives you. In fact, it's all the more reason that we should hear God's will that family is meant by him to be a blessing. All the more reason to hear and strive to keep the command more fully, honor your father and your mother. By working for all that we're worth to confront and cut out sin in our families when it crops up. To put pride, to put envy, to put greed and shame back away from us. 
And instead of those things, prefer to show respect to our parents. To prefer showing love and fellowship towards our children, and for that matter, our children's spouses. To prefer unity with our siblings over almost every other thing in life. That much is absolutely clear from the scriptures. All of which makes what Jesus says in our gospel reading this evening more than a little surprising. Brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father will deliver his child to death. Children will rise against their parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now all Jesus is doing here is spelling out how holding on to him in faith all too often will go in a world like ours that is so sinful and, frankly, God-forsaking. Trusting in Christ as your Savior, trusting in him as your Lord and as the foundation of your life, that he is the one who's really worth hoping in and holding on to, that will, often as not, generate conflict, even in our families. Not because Christ is trying to bring conflict, but because holding on to him and pointing others to him, actually walking in this life um, in the way that he calls you to live, that sort of thing just is going to turn out to be in conflict with a whole lot of things that our sinful world values very deeply. It's going to be in conflict with things that our own members of our family might value deeply and hold very near and dear to their hearts. It will be. Just take a few samples of Christian beliefs. Simple ones. America isn't actually king. God is. Your feelings, your desires are not really what's important in life. God's desires are. You cannot control God's attitude toward you. You can't. Christ controls God's attitude toward you. There's just three very simple, very obvious Christian f beliefs. But you take any one of those and you really run with them. You are going to have people, even your own family members, who are going to start butting heads with you, sometimes pretty severely. And Jesus' advice to people who run into this kind of conflict, um, even from their own family members, it's not do what you have to do in order to keep peace, since family is one of God's greatest gifts. Instead, Jesus' advice is the one who endures to the end. In other words, who endures the kind of conflict, that sort of hatred. The one who endures that kind of suffering, even at the hands of your own family. The one who endures all of that for his name's sake, who holds to faith even over family. That one will be saved. Apparently, in Jesus' mind, there is at least one relationship. There is at least one thing in this life that is more important than our relationship to our moms and our dads. More important than our relationship to our kids or even to our husbands and our wives. And that is the relationship we have with Christ as his people. Now that shouldn't actually be surprising that Christ says this. Because after all, in Jesus Christ, God has literally forged us into his family. A family where he is our father, our true father, and where we are our heavenly father's true children, actual sons and daughters of God. In fact, we are blood relatives of the father. Because after all, what has the father done? He sent his son, his divine eternally begotten son, who is one with him in dignity, in nature, in glory. The Father sent this member of the divine triune family to take on human flesh and blood. But God does so much more than simply enter the human race. He goes on to offer up his body, his flesh, his blood 
for us. He goes so far as to spill his blood in our place. A tremendous thing. A sacrifice that shows where Jesus actually treats us like his brothers and sisters. But that's not the extent of it. He goes even further than this huge grace of treating us like family. He turns around and he actually puts his flesh and his blood into you. He invites you to eat his body and drink his blood. And as he does so, he fills you with his own divine life and his own divine identity. His own kinship with the Father is put into you. Just like he says in John chapter 6, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. But whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I remain in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. To put that quite simply, Jesus makes you his own flesh and blood by filling you with his flesh and blood so that his father is now literally your father. So that you become and are kin to one of the fam or you are kin to Christ. You are one of his family. And everything therefore that the family shares, you have a share in. Which is why I say that it shouldn't be surprising that Christ takes this idea of enduring in him so seriously. Even more seriously than maintaining good relationships with your God-given earthly families. Because for God, there is nothing more important than family. But you are, first of all, God's family. You have no father who is more of a father than him. Indeed, as we who hope in Christ should know perfectly well, things now lie exactly as Paul describes them in Ephesians chapter 3. Every family, every earthly father, really they are only our families and they are only our fathers in a derivative sense. Their identity as father, their identity as family, flows out of God's identity as father. They are, at best, reflections of him. They are at most reminders or representatives of his glory and his goodness and his compassion and care and mercy. So the honor that we owe to our parents, by the same token, it's merely a way of honoring the one our parents are meant to reflect. Our true father who is in heaven. And we honor them and the love and care and sacrifice, we sacrifice for all of these members of our earthly families precisely as a way of honoring and loving and hoping in our brother Jesus and all that he has done to make us sons and daughters of his father. So quite naturally, when our insistence on calling God Father and Christ, things like Redeemer, Lord, Savior, and Brother... When those give rise to conflict, even in our own families, we are called by Jesus to endure the conflict and hold it to Christ no matter how long our conflict goes and no matter how bitter it gets. We are to hold to our true family rather than appease our earthly families. And quite naturally, that kind of enduring also becomes... As it turns out, the very way that we live well as brothers and sisters, as sons and daughters, or mothers and fathers. Because by enduring in that way, by enduring through holding to Christ, what we end up doing is showing our earthly families all of the honor that God commands us to give them. Because what we end up doing is loving them in this deep self-sacrificial way that God commands us to love them. Well, how could that be if we're actually fighting with them, or rather, they're picking fights with us because of Christ? Well, because by such endurance, 
what we end up doing is showing our earthly families, the divine family, that they are meant to reflect. The family that is the source of our earthly family's dignity and unity with one another. We hold up to them the image of our Heavenly Father and of Christ, God's only begotten Son, and of Christ, our brother. And the reflection they therefore see in us holding on to that divine family stands as a constant call to all of our earthly family members to wake up from any and every sinful excuse of family that they're trying to live and instead start reflecting the glory and the love of the Father and the Son and the way that the Father and the Son love those who have been joined to them in the bonds of blood and into that eternal family. So whatever conflicts you face, even with your family members over your faith, endure in him. For Christ, your brother, and therefore your heavenly father, they do have aims on enduring with you, as though you were their own flesh and blood. Because now, through Christ, you are. Amen. Me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, from whence all earthly families take their name, their authority, and dignity, we thank and praise you that you have given us such wonderful blessings in our earthly families. We thank you for the many faithful fathers and mothers who guide their children through this life, who provide them with all the things you seek for them to enjoy, and above all, who guide them to call on you as their true father. Lord, we ask that you would be and abide with all parents in their callings, that they might always strive to more fully reflect the glory you have shown us as our Father, that where there is brokenness in families, parents might be called to repent, to confess their sins, to receive your forgiveness, seek forgiveness from their children, and be reconciled to those they are charged with caring for. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have united all of us Christians to yourself as your own family. Knit us together into Christ's own flesh and blood. We pray, therefore, that you would keep your family, the church, throughout all the world faithful. That they might endure all conflicts and promote a faithful witness. That the world may see what life in your family is like and might enter into the same family life with us for all eternity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you still rule and govern even those who refuse to be joined to your family with grace and mercy. We thank you for earthly governors who promote a measure of peace and justice. We ask that you would equip them for the tasks that they lead, especially in our nation at this difficult time, that whatever they do might promote unity and find a way through the divisiveness that currently afflicts our nation. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we lift up all those who cry out to you for health and healing. We pray especially for Janet Smithenry and Sherry Danke. We pray for all those who are alone and cut off from the blessings of their family. For our shut-ins Bessie Booty, Daryl Booty, Loma Booty, Joanne Cunningham, and Dorothy Hyden. Give all of them the assurance of your abiding steadfast love that will not forsake them, but will raise them all up to your heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we gather around your altar to receive the body and blood of your own Son and be filled with his life, 
So now remind us that by this great gift of forgiveness and life and salvation, he remains in us, and therefore you remain with us. Lord, in your mercy. There are many things on our hearts and minds. We lay them all before your throne of glory, trusting that you will hear us for the sake of our brother, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he, blessed is he, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. O Christ, the Lamb of God.
seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to light in the Gentiles and the glory of thy people is Brian glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for He is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.
This week, enjoy the blessings of your families. For those of you who do not have those particular blessings, know that you are truly blessed with the true family and with more brothers and sisters, frankly, than you can count, thanks to your Heavenly Father. Um, as you go out, uh, again, fathers grab the candy, mothers grab the flowers. Um, those of you who have ordered the, my first catechism, they should be arriving this next week. Grab some Sunday school materials on your way out. Go in His grace, serve Him. Thank you.